pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to start by suggesting that the circular economy is a little bit like this wheel that's been invented and isn't attracting much venture capital. So it's not a new concept, we know what it is, but we still have some refinement to do if it's really going to be useful. This is not a new idea, it's something that's been around for many decades and some of you may even recall that uh, the concept of spaceship, uh, spaceship economy, uh, which was uh, Kenneth Boulding, an economist in 1960s, came up with that. Uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, was another one and Barbara Ward really talking about how we have to design the whole uh, economy as if it were a spaceship where we can throw nothing away. So that was in the 1960s. I'm not that old, so my journey really started in the 1990s when uh, I was chosen to represent South Africa at an international conference. I was a young student of business and the conference was on sustainable development. It was just in 1990 in the, in the lead up to the Rio Earth Summit. We were giving youth input and we had to bring a case study and so I chose the waste industry of Cape Town, which is this beautiful city that you see on the slide. And I really got, got, to, got to know what was going on with recycling, what problems were, so this is nothing new. We've been grappling with this for many, many decades. Um, but when we really started to, to hear about the circular economy, cradle to cradle, it became really obvious to me as both a practitioner as a consultant uh, running KPMG's sustainability services and then later as an academic at Cambridge University and elsewhere that unless we get this circular principle right, uh, everything else we do will be like shifting deck chairs on the Titanic. And so I made it one of the fundamental pr principles in several of the books that I've written uh, to try and get people to redesign how they do this. Then after writing 28 books, I began to wonder if anybody's reading them. So I thought, maybe film is a better mo uh, mode, a uh, better medium. And I thought, well, what could I make as a film to get this message across? And because I love books so much, not only writing them, but reading them, I thought, what if we took the journey of a book and we looked at all of the resource inputs to a book? Where does the ink come from? Where do the trees get felled and how are they grown? And, and where does the... Kindle reader get manufactured and what chemicals go into that. And we told the story of the book, wouldn't that be a, a really interesting way to make people aware of how interconnected things are, but also what those impacts are. So I started putting together some, some, some proposals. This one never flew, but uh, I uh, managed to connect with a, uh, a director, Emmy Award winning and Telly Award winning director from the United States. and put the proposal to do a documentary on the circular economy. And so that's been a two and a half year project. It came out uh, earlier this year on Earth Day. And we're very proud of it, of course. It is the world's first feature length documentary on circular economy. And I really hope that you will all get a chance to watch it or indeed to organize screenings, which are happening all around the world uh, uh, as we speak. So what I would like to do today then in this short time is just share a few of the stories that emerged from this documentary, which took us to Latin America, to Africa, and around Europe, uh, about what's working. Because despite seeing a trailer where it seemed to all be bad news, what I wanted to do was to make a documentary about the solutions. And that really is the main emphasis. And we found them wherever we went. So as I, sh as I go through, I'm going to share what I think are the 10 lessons that emerged. And the first lesson really was, to keep it simple, I mean, when we talk about sustainability or circular economy, most people's eyes glaze over. Now, they don't know what it is. In one of my books, I wrote that sustainability, and perhaps it applies to circular economy, for most people, clearly not the people in this room, but for most people, is about as exciting as watching lettuce wilt in the sun. So we have a storytelling challenge here, and I think we've failed drastically in telling the story of sustainability more generally and circular economy more specifically. So in the documentary, we kept, uh, kept it to a simple model. Of course, everybody knows the, the three R's, reduce, re reuse, and recycle. 
Uh, I thought it very important that we add at least another two, and that's renew and reinvent, which I'll explain as we go through. But just find a way to communicate this far more simply if we're going to make this a mass movement, which is what it needs to be. So let's keep it simple. We had a number of cases that we filmed, and uh, one of the flagships, of course, was Interface. You will know it as the carpet manufacturer. Um, and in 1994, when Ray Anderson, then CEO, had his epiphany moment and uh, decided that they will become the first truly sustainable company and set about mission zero, then everybody who was working for him said, this guy must be round the bend. And he said, absolutely, that's what a leader needs to be able to do, is to see round the bend where other people can't see. And so. We filmed uh, at their facilities in Europe, and I think the lesson from Interface is really to be ambitious. The reason why they have innovated and been such an inspiration to companies all around the world is because they set that mission zero, zero negative environmental impact. And when they set it, Ray Anderson asked the team to say, how long will that take? And they said, well, we could do it by the end of the century not this century, but the last century. They thought it would take six years. And of course, they were completely wrong. If you're gonna do it properly, this is really a difficult task to get to negative impact zero. So to their credit, rather than making it less ambitious, they kept the target, but they shifted it to 2020. And as we found out, they're on track for that. Uh, so if you look at their their product footprint that's gone down two-thirds since 1994. If you look at greenhouse gases, it's down more than 90, 90%. If you look at water and waste, also down more than 90% since 1994. So a really inspiring company, and uh, we really tease out what, they, what they're doing. They use high-tech laser, for example, to create these very minimal strips of waste of carpets. They work with the fishing net collection from the oceans to turn that into carpets. They're working with collecting glass from our, from our cars to get the PVC out of that and turn that into carpets. So a really inspiring story there. But the key to their success, as indeed to Unilever, has been that they have been ambitious. Then uh, on, on reuse, we filmed in South Africa a company called Barlow World Equipment, but they're an agency for Caterpillar, which does the heavy earth-moving equipment. And in South Africa, they have the second largest remanufacturing plant in the world. It's, it's vast. It's many, many times this aud auditorium here. And essentially what they do is they have smart meters on all of their equipment, Caterpillar equipment around the world, and they can sense when something is needing to be repaired before it breaks, or if it's starting to break. And then they bring it back and they remanufacture, they recondition, they repair it. And the key lesson I took away from this is that they're able to demonstrate as a result that this saves the customer between 20 and 60% of the cost of what they would have to pay to get that part new. And I think if we're gonna win the circular economy war, we have to get much better at articulating what is the benefit for the customer or indeed for your other stakeholders that are involved. We then uh, looked at the recycling story, which was Dutch Awareness, and uh, they're a company that uh, makes circular clothing. And in fact, this suit that I'm wearing today is the world's first circular suit. So this was filmed uh, two years ago now uh, in, in the Netherlands, it was the first batch. And what does that mean? Well, it's made from polyester, but they've designed it in such a way that it can be recycled not once, but eight times. So this thread that this suit is made from can be turned back into, into polymers, back into thread, and back into suits eight times. A suit that might have had a life for five years now has multiple lives for 40 or 50 years. Not only that, but they're working with a construction company, Dura Vermeer, also in the Netherlands, so that right at the end of the life of all of that uh, uh, clothing, it's not only suits that they make, but also workwear, they will then be able to 
turn that into construction materials. So at the moment in the Netherlands, most of the dikes and the canals are reinforced with tropical hardwood from Indonesia, one of the least sustainable materials you can get. And so working with them to create this rather as a construction material from waste. So again, a very in inspiring story. Now, there are complexities on this, and they have designed, for example, a circular content management system for those that are interested in the supply chain of this. And one of the challenges they face is how do they get all of those people in that group? And they figured that for every product that they have, they need about 22 parties involved. How do they get them all to share information? Because all of them say, yes, we support circular economy. Yes, we're into sustainability. But no, we don't want to share our information because that's classified and that's confidential. So that's one of the real challenges we have today with this area. We then filmed on the Renew story two companies, one called Biogen in the United Kingdom. It makes uh, uh, renewable energy from food waste and Novamont, which does biodegradable and um, bio-based plastics. So Biogen uh, literally collects food waste, uh, puts it into anaerobic digesters, and creates biogas from it. And then the slurry that's left over goes onto the fields. Scientific tests show that, in fact, the yields from those fields uh, are even higher than using chemical fertilizers. So it's a win-win all over. But the real lesson from there was they're struggling to get enough food waste into their process. They have capacity to do much more. They can expand this, and it's a wonderful, elegant solution. But all of the municipalities in the United Kingdom are doing their own thing, and many of them are not going to the effort of making sure that food waste is collected, whether it be from households or from restaurants or from hotels. And so that's the real challenge. Novamont, uh, as I said, does biodegradable plastics. And what I realized here is that there is no excuse anymore for single-use plastics. I mean, seriously, we have the technology. We have biodegradable plastics. They function extremely well, including with food, which is the main, uh, the main focus of, of Novamont. So they've worked with Lavazza, the global coffee company, to make compostable coffee capsules. So a really elegant solution so that for all of these coffee machines, you're not just throwing away more and more plastic. Very different, I noticed, from the coffee machine in my hotel room, which has a throwaway insert tray, uh, has coffee wrapped in a plastic bag, has an individual stirring stick wrapped in plastic. Yeah, we've really got to get away from this, uh, and we have the solutions. So biodegradable plastics. And for them as well, the issue is not that they don't have the technology, it's that they need the demand. They need customers to be demanding biodegradable plastics. Then we filmed uh, an organization called Redisa in South Africa as well that does tire recycling effectively or re, uh, reconstitution. And some, some wonderful lessons here, mainly about creating an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. And the way that they did it in South Africa was every manufacturer of tires, Continental, Dunlop, and so on, pays a very, very small tax on each tire that comes into the country. And that is enough money to set up this ecosystem of uh, processes of tires. So you see there you have the uh, collectors, um, so that's Pumla. You see they're collecting tires in the low-income areas that are lying around, just creating not only waste but also health hazards. Uh, and that becomes a job for her. And then you get people like, um, here we've got uh, Stefan over here, and he, he creates a, def, uh, a depot, and he becomes an entrepreneur, whereas before he didn't have a job, and now he's putting on food on the table for, for 12 families. And so this has been very successful, and it's a wonderful model. I think we should be creating it. Uh, one of the takeaways I took from that was uh, one of the women who set this up said, you know, there are people here that never had a bank account in their life that now are suddenly have the dignity of being able to open a bank account. Not only that, she said, but unless we do this right, we're going to create a circular economy for the elite. And that's going to be a terrible failure of, of all of our efforts. 
This can't be only an exclusive solution for a minority. It has to include everyone, everywhere, all the time. Then we filmed in Quito, in Ecuador, and this was really looking at what the municipality is doing, what the city is doing. And there it was about finding diverse solutions around the city. So we looked at what General Motors is doing. They have a zero waste manufacturing plant there. They've created a reverse osmosis a water purification plant so that all the water coming out of that factory, which is all full of chemicals, gets purified and goes back into the system. We filmed in the cloud forests, uh, dairy farmers in the cloud forests, and community organizations that this man on the top left used to spend his life uh, as a child hunting bears and cutting down the forest. Today he protects bears and he reforests the whole region. And so it's been a way to really rethink what they're doing. One of the stories I really liked from Quito was a small company that takes Tetra Packs, which as you probably know are what you get your milk or your juice in, which are actually a little bit terrible to recycle because they consist of a layer of cardboard, a layer of plastic, and a layer of foil. But this little company has figured out a way to turn that into useful products. And in fact, they upcycle them into all kinds of things, corrugated roofs, jewelry, furniture, all of which sell for a lot more than the original Tetra Packs. And in fact, in some parts of the world, they get paid to take the Tetra Pack away because it's just seen as waste. And for them, it's this wonderful resource that they create uh, good products from. So that's, that's as far as the film goes. And what came up uh, over and over was that there is an important policy angle to support all of these uh, entrepreneurs, all of these innovators around the world. And um, this you may not be able to read from the back, but this in, in the EU is the policy that we have now around waste. Uh, which is particularly focused on five areas, plastics, food waste, critical raw materials, construction and demolition, and biomass and bio-based products. And there are some very ambitious goals. Uh, and this is a key, I think, to making this really work. So in the case of the EU, by 2035, at least 65% uh, um, should recycle, uh, and and there should be uh, 10%, less than 10% going to landfill. And 70% of all packaging waste uh, should be recycled by 2030. By the way, 100% of plastic packaging must be recyclable by 2030. And then you see some breakdowns of the sorts of rates they want to achieve. Another real breakthrough, I think, that we've seen in Europe quite recently is the launch of the product environmental footprint and organizational environmental footprint methodology because there's so many methods out there for working out your life cycle impact and they're very expensive to do. And so now we've got a standardized methodology for the whole of Europe and indeed for the whole of the world that is very simple to do but very comprehensive and very low cost. And if we start to make the standard across all companies and all products will start to see a real change. I think the lesson uh, that I learned also is, is about riding the, the tide of social movements. And you've probably seen this iconic picture that was featured in uh, National Geographic. In case you haven't figured it out, that's not an iceberg, that's a plastic bag. And this rise of plastics uh, as an issue is, is really caught us by surprise. This is me in Bruges with the uh, Ocean Plastics uh, Greenpeace sculpture. And we've seen it around the world and we've talked a little bit about it, the plastic bag bans, the banning of single-use plastics, the EU plastic strategy with various ways to track that and to measure that. So we need to key into these social movements because this was nowhere two years ago and today it's really changing behavior. So let me end then by saying we have to then integrate because uh, there are several elements to transforming on sustainability of which the circular economy dealing with ecosystem destruction is only one. You know, we also have the issue of technology that we've talked about, tackling disconnection in the digital economy. We have tackling the issue of access through the sharing economy. We have tackling well-being. Um, and making products that really address our health and happiness. 
and we have the resilience economy as well. And it's only when we bring all of these together with the circular economy that we'll get real solutions. So in conclusion, where, where does this leave us? I, I like this quote by David King. So he says, human ingenuity is the answer. We created the uh, technological revolution on which our well-being is based. Uh, and so we, we have the solutions. We can create the solutions to the problems that we now face. And so when people ask me, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, I say, no, I'm a possibilist. Uh, I do believe that it's possible. Uh, we broke it. We can fix it. Thank you. <clears throat>